I mean, we were looking into like what like music industry and like lyrics on how a lot of lyrics portray women through the different decades. That was the original idea to see women through the decades through music. But then we just got stuck on this one song and you started researching like the stats of domestic abuse that is happening right now. You know, the funny thing was that we were looking at how incredibly misogynistic songs can be so hilarious. And because we both love com comedy so much, like we were so kind of just like, you know, reading and laughing and crying and reading and laughing and crying over just like this massive list of songs. And this particular one was the one that was the most, I don't know, it just hit in the right way, so to say. Like, look at all these layers, like looking at it like, ha, ah, this is so funny, you know? But that's not, they really believe this. And also like, who, who pushed this motive? Why are you promoting this behavior? Since the beginning, like since they released it, it was so interpretable. Like, um, you know, it was aired for a bit and then they stopped. And then later on, like they, you know, they said I was, it's a feminist anthem, which is like, even now when you look at it, you can see like, this song is great, but also not. Some people look at it saying, oh my God, this is terrible. Some people look at it saying, of course, of course, imagine those women in the house all day nagging at their husbands, of course they get hit. So I think, you know, that's why it's great because it's so interpretable and it's always like for everyone, it's a different approach. Of course, we all know what is the right one, but um, yeah. I read comments on the actual song that's like uploaded to YouTube. Oh, this song was so controversial, but it's a really good song. And I'm like, it is, I love it musically. Um, but then another comment that got quite a lot of likes said, people are interpreting this as domestic abuse, but really it is a love story. I'm like, uh. yeah. Like yeah, it is, I suppose, yeah. from the woman who sings it, because if she genuinely believes that this is why you love me, this is why you do this, that's totally valid that that's what she believes, but it's just a shame. <laughs> I've, yeah, but that's the thing is like, you know, for the for victims, you know, violence is already like a sign of, you know, for not all of them, but for most of them, they get used to this, this is their life. So it's very hard to break away from that. And to just say, now I'm leaving, like I'm doing my own thing. It's the only thing that you know. So I, I do believe that a woman sings that song that we just sang um, and mm. means it, you know, in the, in the literal way of the, of the song, yeah. It's kind of like a love that you crave if it's something you're used to as well. Because um, like the first ever relationship I was in, um, obviously being exposed to love for the first time was really abusive and then when I got out of that I kept asking my partners like new partners why don't you love me and they're like what do you mean and I'm like but why is there no passion why is there no fire yeah. I want you to shout at me I want us to fight why do you not want to shout why do you not want to and it's just crazy I believe that as well you know Definitely. Yeah. I think, I don't know how it's Thailand, but you know, I presume similar, but you know, Romania where I grew up, it's very like domestic violence is like something is normal for a man to hit a woman a bit, you know? So I think, you know, we grew up knowing that and kind of if something hap like this happens or, you know, not severe violence, you still think it's kind of pseudo normal. And then, yeah. And then there's yeah. that, but what did she do to deserve it? Yeah. 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 And it's like, she can do anything. She still doesn't deserve it. And it's, I mean, we see it in the stats. Even, you know, to Google domestic violence lockdown, you found millions and trillions of articles everywhere in every newspaper. Um, so, yeah, that, that's why we just kind of glued that in there. The, you know, the International Women's Day theme this year of like the, the choose to challenge, it comes in the right, like, you know, in the right time, so to say, because it is a celebration, but you know, equally, it's a raising awareness day when we are allowed to put all this out there and to make all this sarcastic videos and funny videos and sad videos. So yeah, otherwise we'd have gone out in the streets, but this year is not possible. So there you go. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Mireya Joanals. 
I'm an actress and a theatre maker from Barcelona, Spain. Um, and since I've created theatre, I've created political theatre. Well, I think all theatre is political. I think the simple act of being an artist within a capitalist society is political because you're choosing to pay attention to your feelings, you're choosing to slow down, you're choosing to play by your own rules, uh, you're choosing to care about yourself, to care about others, to care about your surroundings. Um, and that in itself is a political act. Uh, and so all my life I've created political theatre. Um, that's something I talk about in The Edge, which is a play I did in 2017, which is being revisited now. And I talk about that need to slow down and, and that ever growing gap between the natural world and the material world and that we are so separated from nat from nature that we've kind of forgotten our own natural rhythms um, just for this need of constantly being productive at whatever cost. Um, so that's something I'm really passionate about, that reconnection with nature, with rhythms, with your own rhythms, with your own artistic rhythms. Um, this care, I think, caring for one another, I think, is a really strong revolutionary act. Uh, and so that reflects in the way in which I create theatre, which is always very horizontal, always very collaborative, um, and always really playful. I think play should be present in every step of the creative process. Um, because when you do multidisciplinary theatre, a lot of people haven't acted before it. So um, through play is a way to in which you can learn from them and you can bring your own things to the table as well. Uh, it's a really good way to create material where everyone is equal. Uh, everyone is playing and lots of things come out. And then from all this play and all this crazy creation, you just create loads and loads of materials. And from that, you pick and choose what works. Um, so I think you can, the, the starting point for devising can literally be anything. You can have a very clear idea of what you want to say, which is not often my case because I'm a bit more of a messy creator. Uh, or you can make theater the starting point can be anything. It can be an object, it can be a quote, it can be a sentence, uh, it can be an image. So for the edge, it was this image I had of like this tree made out of plastic, how we're destroying nature, the, the, the very own thing that allows us to be alive. Uh, and we were uh, changing it for these plastic things. Um, and with Bodoc House, which is my theater company, uh, it was this text I I wrote uh, when I was 18 years ago and I just always wanted to do something with it because it was really surrealist um, and very raw and it really came from a very deep place inside me uh, and I wanted to do something with it and I got together with this visual artist Mar, uh, Mar Cesafon and this opera singer who, uh, whose name is Julia Piaquillo and we, we just always wanted to collaborate as well and we found in this text this opportunity to really break boundaries and I've realized that we working with artists from different backgrounds I've realized that really we all have we all encounter the same sort of problems so um we, we all encountered that our Disciplines are very rigid of, of what theatre is or what opera is or what uh, visual art is meant to be. Uh, and so we wanted to break with all of that. We wanted to play by our own rules. We wanted to create a new dialogue. And as women, as, as, as creators who are, uh, as female creators, we, we face a very male-based industry in the sense that we encounter that most of the roles and most of the opportunities available are for men when most of the artists are female so that is kind of weird and, uh, and the reason for that is because most of the people making the decisions uh, the producers the writers the directors they are male uh, and so that lack of opportunity translates to into a, a lack a, a higher level of competitiveness and that translates to 
women being taught that other women are the enemy and and that t toxic practice is starts in the institutions and goes on to all the industries uh and so we really wanted to stop that we wanted to collaborate uh this act of rebellion of being like no all arts are gonna are gonna be together and we're gonna go back to a more ancient sacred theater where there is no divides uh, and we want to collaborate, we want to make something together uh, and we want to tell our own stories. You know, we want to reindicate ourselves as artists with our own point of view and uh, and we uh, and the first play we've done, which is called Thoughts of an Incoherent Mind, with this text that we work on, uh, we are allowing ourselves to make mistakes, to not be perfect. We're working with this idea of women needing to be spotless and perfect and well-spoken and well-behaved. And we're taking back the idea that it's okay to fail, it's okay to be messy, it's okay to to love however you want to love uh, without having to deal with these judgmental looks from everyone around you. Um, so that's very important with my work uh, with Puro Chaos and I've, I'm, I've really enjoyed, I'm really enjoying working with them and it's going really well. I'm going to leave you a little bit of this work. Dear fellow humans, for the purpose and good functioning of this performance, it is highly recommended that you leave your brains outside the room. Please. Don't forget to collect them on your way out. Or, if you prefer, we would happily provide you with the latest 21st century updated brain with zero social awareness for a happy and easy life. allowing me to share my work and my thoughts with you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Здравейте, приятели! Казвам се Лора Венцуала Кръстева и се занимавам с театър. За мен... Политическият театър в момента е много важен. Имаме нужда от огледала, които са извън схемите на властта или на капитала. Така че политически театър за мен е този, който задава въпроси. Който представя альтернативи и или който говори за неща, които други искат да замълчат. Скъпи приятели! Пишем ви от ареста. Часът е 19.40 и скоро ще се стъмни. Лампата е два мъждука и няма да можем да напишем всичко, което искаме да ви кажем. Змята хапе най-силно, когато знае, че умира. Тук прасетата са окупирали всички власти и няма кой да ги накаже. Ние никога не сме се крили и няма да се крием. Ние искаме да сме с хората, за да се борим заедно. Осъдена съм на 15 години затвор. За това, че една вечер съм отишла на пицария с неподходящ човек. Деси е осъден на 20 години затвор, защото чрез няколко изявления е поискала подкуп. Реално няма доказателства, че е искала подкуп. Дори излиза, че не го е обсъждала. Осъдена е на 20 години. За убийство дават по-малко. Но политиката на театъра за мен е отвъд темите. Как се прави театър е много важно. Например, аз работя хоризонтално, 
в репетиционната зала с моите колеги и представяме авторски театър по теми, които са важни за нас. Това всъщност е репетиция за альтернативни начини на организация, на живеене заедно, които са извън хиарките, които в момента съществува в нашите общества. What is corruption? We define corruption as the abuse of entrusted power of private gain. Corruption can take many forms and can include behaviors like can include behaviors like a public servant demanding or taking money or favors in exchange for services. Politicians misusing public money or granting public jobs. A contract to their sponsors. Friends and families, corporations bribing officials to get lucrative deals. Материала, който може да видите в това видео, е от а, един видеопротест, който снимахме това лято, миналото лято, 2020, в а, БГ. Той е част от един по-голям проект, който се казва Змята хапе най-силно, когато знае, че умира. Ще споделяме пак материали онлайн от тази пиеса на 24 и на 27 март, този месец, 2021. Така че ви очаквам тогава да се видим пак онлайн и се надявам, че много скоро ще играем и пиеста в БГ, в ЮК и защо ли не в други държави по света. По света и у нас. Така че до тогава пазете се и до нови срещи. În târgul neam să facă nu trebuie să se aseară afară, nu trebuie să meargă singură pe stradă. În târgul neam să facă nu trebuie să se îmbrace cu o să nu trebuie să singură pe stradă. În târgul neam să facă nu să îmbrace cu o să nu trebuie să se 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 îmb
Uh, spectacolul ăsta a fost bazat pe experiențele lor, despre ce înseamnă să fii fată în turneam și pe experiențele mamelor și bunicilor lor, despre ce înseamnă să fii femeie în turneam. Uh, și s-a dezvoltat în cadrul unui proiect de rezidențe în care au lucrat 5 tineri artiști și artiste uh, cu aceste 10 adolescente pentru a scoate la iveală poveștile și impresiile lor. Uh, ce contează pentru mine la toată povestea asta e, în primul rând, uh, faptul că suntem în Târgu Neamț. Târgu Neamț, în mod normal, e un oraș în care nu se întâmplă mai nimic. Uh, și în care cultură înseamnă în continuare ce s-a scris acum 100 și ceva de ani de către niște bărbați. Deci pentru noi e foarte politic faptul că am încercat să aducem niște voci tinere în prim plan, și să le facem cât mai auzite. Un alt element care e pentru mine important și de o politic e acest proces colectiv în care nu a existat niciun fel de ierarhie. Toți artiștii, profesioniști erau ei înșiși într-un proces de învățare. Am avut cinci artiști pe dramaturgie, muzică, dans, scenografie și regie care au învățat de la adolescentele participante și din experiențele lor și nu și-au impus niciun fel viziunea, ci mai degrabă au încercat să le ajute pe ele să-și găsească forța, vocea și curajul să fie vulnerabile. Poate că spectacolul ăsta, toate uraganele au nume de fete, e deocamdată cel mai feminist lucru care s-a întâmplat în urmă Uh, dar în același timp e și un punct de început, uh, pentru că vorbind despre subiectul ăsta, ne-am dat seama că nu trebuie să fii fată în Târgu Neamț, e greu, cred că e la fel de greu să fii băiat în Târgu Neamț, sau bărbat în Târgu Neamț, pentru că și poziția asta îi pune pe ei într-o problemă de presiune, de a acționa în anumit fel, de a fi în anumit fel, care poate nu e cel mai apropiat de ceea ce-ți dorești tu. Deci, următorul nostru punct ar fi să facem un spectacol despre cum e să fii bărbat în Târgu Neam și să deschidem un dialog cu chestia asta, nu doar în Târgu Neam, ci și în localitățile din jur. Și dacă se poate să schimbăm cât mai multe impresii despre Neam cum e să creștem într-o lume pe care nu ne-am ales-o noi, în care multe din reguli și multe din uh, principii sunt nedrepte, foarte multe și foarte mulți, uh, și să găsim împreună niște practici zilnice de a schimba lucrurile astea. Din felul în care suntem, din felul în care ne facem treaba, Uh, prin poveștile pe care le ascultăm și prin vocile pe care le dăm putere. Eu sunt Iana și am făcut parte din spectacolul Toate uraganele au nume de fete. Sunt adolescentă, sunt din Târgu Neam și m-am bucurat atât de mult că a existat această oportunitate pentru a mă afirma uh, și totodată de a mă regăsi în uh, alte situații comune ale unor fetele de ale mele. Pe timpul verii am discutat despre ceea ce înseamnă să fii fată în Târgu Neamț, cum trebuie să te comport, de ce trebuie să faci anumite lucruri, ce trebuie, ce nu trebuie. Și încă o dată sunt atât de fericită că am putut să mă exprim în, într-un asemenea loc și într-un acest context, adică într-o piesă de teatru. Ceea ce am învățat este că nu trebuie să trăiești după anumite concepții ale societății, ci trebuie să fii tu însă și să ai curajul de a trece peste aceste prejudecăți. Această piesă de teatru mi-a marcat vara și încă o dată mă bucură extrem de mult că am avut oportunitatea de a discuta despre aceste concepte. Salut! Eu sunt Elena și fac parte din ceva, din de teatru de ceva. Și am fost uh, prezentă și am participat activ la momentul desfășurat de la trecută despre feminism, uh, și din care a rezultat cu, cu piesă de dat cu multe de care de ne-am luat de pe Pe plan personal, asta m-a schimbat foarte mult. Pe plan extins, cred că a schimbat și mai mult. Pentru că, în afară faptului că a fost un amalgam de schimbe din 
de la plâns, la răsite, la povești din copilărie, uh, atacuri pe stradă, tot felul de alte lucruri. Am împărtășit și în uh, același soflu oarecum. Și am vrea mea să mă că unele povești se repet uneori și chiar dacă uneori le-au reușit să zicem anumite lucruri, la final ne dăm seama că nu suntem chiar atât de diferite și poveștile noastre de la un moment dat se unesc. Cred că a fost o piesă care a deranjat uneori, dar a fost o piesă care a dat curaj și altor fete, pentru că la finalul pieselor, când am fost un mini turneul nostru, primeam, am primit și feedback negativ foarte mult cu tot, dar și feedback pozitiv și cred că asta contează cel mai mult, părere cu oamenilor pe care le-am schimbat în bine, nu în rău. Am, a, fost, a fost la un moment dat o fată care vine la mine și a zis că mă, exact că așa mi s-a întâmplat și mie nu pot să cred, adică și la școală mi s-a întâmplat, mi s-a întâmplat și pe stradă, mi s-a întâmplat pe tot să mi dedicite pentru simplu fapt că eram fată. Și am zis, da, sti, oh my god, mă bucur foarte mult că am găsit chestia asta în comun și în afară faptului că ne-a ajutat pe noi ca și grup să ne întâlnim mult mai tare, ne-a ajutat să, de, să depărtăm puțin ideea asta și în, și în afara orașului, în minitul nostru. Și, și în într-o oraș, bineînțeles. Nu știu să mai zic. Uh, suntem fete, suntem frumoase, suntem super, super mega tari și cred că chestia asta ar trebui să fie mult mai vocalizată și mult mai out of the space. <laughs> Hi! My name is Nisha Abdullah. I live and work out of Bangalore in India. Um, I began my theater practice um, as a performer. I did uh, playback theater and uh, theater of the oppressed. And uh, after a short um, stint with scripted plays, I quickly moved on to playwriting and directing. Um, of late, I've uh, also began working as a direct uh, as a dramaturg. And through all of this. Um, I've always been an educator. Uh, I work on rights based um, uh, modules using the theater and all of my um, work is really anti-oppression at its core. Um, I'm also a founder of uh, Kabila. It is a collective that I founded in 2018. Um, and Kabila's work um, has always been about um questioning the uh, inequities of the time and to uh, build uh, an artistic resistance of sorts to um, the things that cause these um, inequities. Um, yeah. And uh, my work or Kabila's work, I hope would sit in a continuum Um, because India's political theater history is very rich. There's always been anti-caste, um, uh, you know, struggles. There's anti-colonial struggle. There's anti-class um, struggle. All of these have uh, have been realized um, partly through political theater. You know, using the epics to talk to these power structures, um, art forms that. Um, that are uh, native to India, that are fully indigenous, whether it's theater or dance or music, which has constantly questioned um, the power structure. So this is, uh, there's a rich history of this uh, in India. And I would really like for Kabila's work and my work to sit in that continuum. Um, political theater for me is really about imagining uh, a more equal, a more nurturing um, future. And political theater enables the questioning, uh, you know, the impossible questions that we can ask uh, in order to get there, in order to get to that more equal future.
I, I believe very few um, groups of people have the credibility in society today to be able to do this. Um, artists are some of them. Largely, society trusts us to be able to ask some of these questions to, you know, to kind of nudge um, or, 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 you know, kick them into, into uh, questioning, into realizing. Um, but in order for us to be able to do that as political theater makers, I think it's important that our own um, questioning and our own imagining, it must start from the rehearsal room itself. So often my question as a director to myself is what am I doing in the rehearsal space that is enabling uh, an imagining of a more equal future? So, you know, how am I dealing with differences in the room, with dissent in the room, with the hierarchy that is present in the role of the director? Um, so, so what are those best practices that, uh, that come into my practice, that must come into my practice? For me, I, I feel that it's impossible for me to not do political theater at this moment in time. I am a woman, I'm Muslim, I am, um, you know, I come from relative privilege of an English education and I live in an urbanized context. How can I not do political theater at this moment in time? Um, there's extreme polarization in, in India. There is... Um, there is a supremacist dominant culture um, against which um, any kind of marginalized community is constantly trying to survive, trying to assert, um, whether it's legally, whether it's culturally, uh, whether it's politically. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's, it's obvious to me that I would be making political theater. Hello, I'm Shonali Bhattacharya. I'm a playwright and activist from the East Midlands in the UK, currently based in London. I've been asked to answer two questions. The first one is, how do you define political theatre? So I define it in three ways. Firstly, in terms of representation. Very early on in my career, I realised I had to deal with being treated as more of an anthropologist than a storyteller, uh, because of my British Asian background. Um, so there's always going to be a constant struggle about our right to tell our stories full stop and that hasn't gone away. Seeing ourselves on stage is definitely important but superficially uh, ticking boxes in terms of diversity can be a smokescreen for ongoing injustice and inequality. So yes I write about Bengali factory workers, lesbian resistance fighters who organised against Nazi occupation, British Asian teenagers standing up against gentrific gentrification and cultural appropriation in their neighbourhoods. But the political nature of those stories doesn't end just with the casting. As storytellers, we have the opportunity to tell the people's history. This is what representation really means to me. The struggle of ordinary people against capitalism, racism and colonialism. And more importantly, what effective resistance to those things looks like. There are solid reasons why these stories are not widely told in a British mainstream media landscape that still props up the monarchy and the class system uh, and actually thrives on it. So here, state-sponsored racism is ramping up and has been for over a decade. Colonialist legacy is woven into the fabric of our society and neoliberalism is eroding any gains that we've made in terms of workers' rights, equality and social justice. This is all facilitated by a client media who power the government line and also work to instill fear and division in our communities. As a country, we're increasingly isolated from the rest of the world. Our mainstream culture is extremely myopic and also liberal politics often makes for very boring stories and very boring work. So I don't think we can create a better world without being able to imagine one first. And that means everything we write is political. Um, also, the status quo is shit. So I always want to subvert rather than reinforce it. It's easy to succumb to the temptation to just be caught jesters as storytellers and as writers, but we must resist that. Because stories express an alternative. Um, they can be radically optimistic. They can critique 
the right wing narrative that we're sort of forced to consume on a daily basis, and that's inherently political and incredibly important. Thirdly, as theatre makers, our process is as political as a finished production. We are almost always freelancers and the nature of the industry pushes, into, push, pushes us into individualism and atomisation. We are the product. We exploit our own labour. Our work is precarious. We are made to feel grateful for simply being in the creative industries and we are made to compete with one another. The hierarchy of our industry skews our approach to our work and our idea of what, what a career, ladder or otherwise, should look like. But this hierarchy impacts on who is able to participate and also how our work is treated and regarded depending on our backgrounds and our status. This is very boring and repetitive and reductive and helps prop up an increasingly reactionary and moribund mainstream culture in the UK. So for me, my activism is a social duty and my writing and my theatre making is a chance to play. But as David Graeber taught us, play is the ultimate form of liberation and liberation is inherently political. So that brings me on to the second question I've been asked to answer, the way in which I make political theatre. So for me, theatre making offers us the ability to organise collectively and the ability to imagine the future we can build if we do. After the defeat of the first chance to break from Thatcherism in my lifetime in the 2019 UK general election, I realised I wanted to bring together my work as an activist and my work as a theatre maker and playwright more intentionally. More than ever, I think we all need to reflect on what our role is as cultural and arts workers in this era of pandemic and hard right nightmare. How can we find ways to make the process of making our work political? How do we make our protest liberating and playful and so easier and more accessible to participate in? It's become really clear that we can't look to leaders. There is no one behind the curtain. We are the people who have to save us. So how can we use our work and our organising to put into practice the movement building that we need now? For me, the skills and collaboration required to stage a production are similar to those needed to organise a demonstration, and we must do both. The skills required to publicise our work are similar to those required to publicise our campaigning, and we must do both. We must make sure we remove as many barriers to participating in theatre making as we can ourselves. The practical, challenging work of radical inclusivity, horizontal decision making, seeking consensus that many of us strive for in our political activism and agree is necessary for movement building can be practised in making theatre. Hi, my name is Kyla Davis. I'm from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm the founder and director of Well Worn Theatre Company. We are an ecological justice theatre company. We are a non-profit. We've been running for about 10 years. We make uh, touring theatre for predominantly young South African audiences, but also for uh, audiences of all ages. Um, we tour a lot to schools. Um, we started our journey with a particular focus on climate change and then quickly realized that um, there is no ecological justice without social justice. So we broadened our topics of investigation to include social justice issues as well, um, because we feel the two are very closely interlinked. Um, I guess I want to talk specifically about our most recent program, which was a three-year touring play program in, in which we made uh, three different plays um, over a period of three years and toured those plays also for uh, um, a range of age groups. The first one was called Plastocracy, uh, which was for teenagers. Um, and that was about plastic pollution um, and kind of uh, convenience culture and single use culture. Um, and uh, the second one was called Galela, which was a play about water for younger audiences. Uh, water in South Africa, um, well, all over the world, but in South Africa is extremely political. 
Um, so it was our uh, attempt to uh, make that political sort of accessible for younger audiences. Um, the third production we made, which is our most recent production, was called uh, Burning Rebellion, which was a protest poem, a choral work about climate justice, which was inspired by the um, school strike for climate movement that was very big in 2019 and uh, some of 2020. And um, we toured that around South Africa to basically to audiences that were 16 up along with a rigorous kind of uh, talkback session after the poem. Um, yeah, that poem in particular, I think, is our most political work to date. Uh, we wrote it together. Well, we write all of our work together. We devise it and we workshop it on the floor. We're a physical theatre company. We make use of masks and movement and puppet in our um, in our works, um, but Burning Rebellion was quite a stark contrast to our usual aesthetic, um, in that it was really bare bones, no costume, no set, no lighting, just the text, and the performance, the ensemble performance of the text. Um, and uh, I say it's our most political because I guess it's uh, we're the most direct we've ever been. We usually really use story and character and narrative and metaphor to get our message across um, but with burning rebellion we we're quite on the nose um, and i think it came from um it's it stemmed from us being quite tired of saying the same things over and over again and uh, feeling like the, this particular issue of climate justice was reaching a little bit more of a fever pitch um, in the global conversation as well as in the South African conversation. So, um, yeah, that is a, 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 this project has been slightly curtailed by the pandemic and it is our hope to continue to tour it um, and, and also to publish it alongside the performance so that the text is available uh, as a resource for people who might want to perform the poem themselves or to interrogate what is in the poem. Um, I think that's all. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to, um, yeah, to, to engaging with other women uh, globally who are engaged in this kind of work. Um, we are one of the few kind of um, deliberately or not deliberately, but uh, uh, proudly theater activist theater companies in uh, South Africa um, and it is very much a, a passion of ours to uh, to perform live. Um, we have been struggling in the digital age. We do believe that it is the liveness of theatre, of the theatrical experience that is the most impactful when it comes to this kind of work. Um, yeah. I think I'll leave it there and uh, I'll send a, a clip of Burning Rebellion um, so we can start the discussion from there. Thank you. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, group and to make new friends in this, in this network. In other news, reports are coming in of roads melting in Australia with temperatures reaching a record high of 49 degrees centigrade. Oh, World leaders claim that these soaring temperatures are not necessarily linked to climate change. Activists, however, disagree and say that we are to expect even more extreme temperatures in the near future. We're going to need another planet, guys. You can run, 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 but you can't hide forever. Run, 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 but you can't hide forever. Run, 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 but you can't hide forever. We need to unlearn the shock doctrines that condition us and imprison us in the red race of the consumer machine. The hamster wheel <coughs> chasing price tag trees. For only two million trees per day. Hypnotized by the Pied Piper's too. We are slow dancing in a burning room while they disembowel our home, our earth. Can you hear her howl? Steaming as they rip and tear her flesh and bone. Gouging out her core, searching for more and more and more 
More gold, more coal, more gas, more oil. oil. Foreign countries mining on African soil. Neo-colonialism. Rotting red turmoil. Death, Death from the inside. It's, it's the genocide. Destructive extraction devastates communities. Colombian. Fuleni. They have a right to say no to these mine dumps, to these mass raids. They have a right to choose not to be enslaved. Simon. But we're afraid, guys. We are very, very afraid. Hello and welcome to Glaude Political Theatre as a Women's Right. This is a special International Women's Day event. Um, and today we are joined by four theatre makers from around the world who make incredibly inspire, inspiring work. Um, Kyla Davis is here, Jobre Ilescu, Nisha Abdullah, and Shonali Bhattacharya. I'll say that again. Shonali Bhattacharya, sorry. Um, First, um, I would like to ask all of you a couple of questions about how uh, you actually make theater, your process. Uh, and I'd like to start with you, uh, Joe. Um, listening to the two girls um, that you uh, invited uh, part of, as part of this project, Diana and Elena, it seemed that the actual process of making Uragane was incredibly empowering and that uh, they, they became very um, uh, attached to each other and they found some sort of sisterhood and solidarity and I wanted to ask you whether that is something to do with a non-hierarchical way that you rehearsed or worked together? It might as well be. Uh, the main area that we work with uh, at Java Performative Arts Centre is uh, pedagogical and uh, we do stress the importance of the process more than that of the result. Uh, so yes, I think from the beginning, what we had is uh, was a very safe space in which the 10 teenagers, who are also the performers and uh, the writers and the co-directors of the, of the play. Um, yeah, I think from the beginning, they understood that what is most important is the way in which they feel and what they get out of this. Uh, so yes, there was, there was a safe space from the beginning uh, and the artists that they worked with were also going through a learning process uh, because they had never worked with uh, teenagers or with unprofessional artists uh, and they were also very very open to getting feedback so what i noticed was that the girls themselves the teenagers they started to know what they want and what the course of of the work uh, that they desire is and they were really setting boundaries even with, with the residents. So they were saying, we don't like this. We don't want to be talked to that way. And we want this process to, to go in a certain way. And they were really active in, uh, in determining how that goes. And I think that is seen. Uh, actually, the end, uh, the end song uh, of the performance is one in which they say, we have the courage to be, be vulnerable because we have our sisters with us. That is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's incredible. And you can really tell uh, that they're very confident. The, the, two, the two girls who uh, sent videos, you can tell that they're very secure in who they are um, and that they're not afraid to speak up and, and be themselves. And that's, that's incredibly encouraging. Um, were they like that when you met them or do you feel that the, the process of working with you on this project has heightened that confidence? Well, they, they are definitely as teenagers, and I have been working for years with teenagers. Uh, they're just waiting for a chance in which to be taken seriously and uh, given a platform for their voice. So maybe that's, that's partly the default, that teenagers are very open to, to action and to experiment. But definitely having a, a context like this, I think it, it might help them in the long run whatever they decide to do, whether it's artistic or not. Thank you. Um, because we're talking about process, I wanted to uh, send uh, to ask Kyla about your process of making because um, collaboration and devising is also at the core of your work. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and before I start, I just want to say I was struck also in engaging with everybody's work, how much process is at the core of, of everybody's work. Um, and I mean, I think I'll start by saying that we really believe that theatre is a, is a social project. Um, 
we it, it's it's inherently collaborative the the way in which we make theater um we devise everything so we start with a an image or a poem or a picture um, we've already decided are we making a play about water or climate change or plastic or whatever the theme is but then we need to find a way in so what we do is we we engage in a kind of um, research period where we bring a whole bunch of stuff into the room uh, film clips or whatever it is that that we find inspiring and is a way for us to hook into the material. Um, and after this, then then we spend some time playing with that material. So we'll put things on the floor with improvisations, with movement, with uh, puppetry, masks, um, music. We do also use a lot of uh, songs that we write um, in, in, in our pieces. Um, and then we basically just keep playing until we found a chunk of material really and then we start to slowly um and this i think is also a hugely democratic process you know to 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 start to cut away and say okay what serves the story best um even though we really love this piece and we love this song that we made it actually isn't serving the the overall story or it's not age appropriate or we'll save it for another piece at a later stage and then slowly but surely together, we kind of chip away at the material until we have the core of something. Um, and then we practice, then we rehearse, you know, we start to fine tune it. Um, and uh, yeah, someone recently described this process as, as maybe taking a, a chunk of clay and then, you know, slowly carving your, which is very much like mask making as well, which we do a lot of, you know, allowing the, rather than, looking for the thing to come out of the clay allowing the the shapes to emerge from the clay which is very much how how we work you know seeing seeing what can emerge from the people in the room in this exact moment so absolutely we um so i'm just looking at my notes here <laughs> yeah collaborative inquiry um we 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 play we improvise we experiment and we search also for a style together um according to the strengths in the room as well so it's inherently democratic our process even though and we might talk about this later but yeah sometimes democratic theater making <laughs> doesn't always make for the best theater but certainly we we try for a democratic and a and a um uh, also a, a non-hierarchical process in the room thank you kyla and i wanted to ask you do you have a permanent company that you work with a group of actors or does it change from project to project yeah for the i mean this is always been our dream to have a, a a repertoire company and for the last three years we had project funding that allowed us to do so so i was working with the same actors over this over a period of three years on three different productions which was a, a gift really because then you really start to know each other where your weak points are where your strong points are and it becomes very much like a family and a safe space as joe was saying Fantastic. How about you, Joe, just to bring it back with Cheva? Are you striving to work with the same group of teenagers again after this project? Well, with teenagers, it's always very difficult because you only have them for a couple of years and then they go away. Uh, so right now we're really under pressure a bit. Uh, we want to make a, a dialogue performance about the experience of being a boy or uh, a man. In this, uh, in this area, generally in Romania and uh, particularly in the city, which is uh, quite patriarchal, I would say, in a rather conservative uh, environment. Um, and yeah, our, our goal from the beginning was to work with teenagers and we've been active for three years here. Uh, but we've, and we've only started to realize what the needs are uh, because of course teenagers are one uh, group which are not taken into account so much but they're not the only one and uh, what we would like to do is kind of unite these uh, these marginal voices and make them work for one another thank you um shonali i wanted to ask you something about um you mentioned in your video uh, in your video uh, you talk about representation and how important that is um and i wanted to ask you especially in the uk as a playwright how do you make sure that your work is made by the right people yeah it's a really good question actually um because obviously there's enormous barriers to um 
participating in the theatre industry um, and Britain is you know we, we have an extremely you know we're really riddled by class dynamics and the theatre industry very much so is um, it's quite rare to meet you know to, to meet people um, who are working um, in a sustainable way you know that they can persist in the industry who aren't from quite privileged backgrounds actually and that's not at all to district you know to dismiss a lot of those very privileged people who are some of whom are very talented but it's still uh, it's undeniable that there are you know there are many barriers um so i think that there's i mean there's a few things i think representation is key but as i mentioned in my video i think that's only the first that's really just the most superficial thing um for me that seems quite a natural thing i write about um I write about the world I see around me. I write about my own experience, but I also write about um, the experience of my community and of, of, of the experience of people who um, I, you know, feel, feel an affinity with, and that's that's now or in history. Um, but it, those people usually, it's not just because they happen to look like me or they happen to be women. It's usually about something much deeper about that. It's often about a, a commitment to. Um, a cause it's often about the 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 resistance and the uh, resilience that they they either they've demonstrated as characters or uh, people in real life who have demonstrated that whose voices and whose stories have not been sort of honored or, or recognized um so i think that it, i think the nature of my work the approach to my work um inherently attracts a certain kind of collaborator so i've been really lucky in that um you know, I've, I've, I've sort of over the years have, you know, established really fantastic working relationships with collaborators who, who, um, who, uh, who feel, who, who, who find that kind of work appealing, basically. So it's, it's, it's something like for me, I think it's, I think there's a couple of things. It's, it's not just about subject matter as well. It's about the rigor that you approach that subject matter with. So you can always have to make sure that you don't just have um, so, for instance, I don't think you can have a superficial commitment to someone's politics, like a character's politics. You have to be quite rigorous about that. And the more rigorous you are, um, the more likely you are to be, you know, end up working with collaborators who also have that same attitude and that same rigor, because the level of understanding is, you know, is they, they want they want to sort of dig deep into that. Um, and then I also think it's about like starting to shrug off your self censorship as a, as a theatre maker as well. Like, so when I first came into writing, uh, you know, I've been writing for a, lot, like a long time now, like I was quite young when I started writing and the level of self-censorship that I look back, that I used to have was quite, was quite profound actually, um, which is understandable. You know, there's a level of fear, there's a level of like, you feel very lucky and very grateful to be in the industry, which you're obviously encouraged to feel as well because that encourages self-censorship. Uh, I think over the years I've shrugged that off. I don't, I've sort of got to a point where I happily just don't, don't give as much of a shit anymore. And that in itself, you know, brings people into like my sort of working sphere who have a similar lack of, lack of giving a shit, I guess. <laughs> and I feel like that's the door into being able to, to grapple with things in a more, in a more serious way, but also in a more playful way, like feeling confident enough to be able to dig down deep into into yeah more sort of political and more sort of uh, provocative ideas and themes um i wanted to ask you a little bit about how present you are in the rehearsal room when your plays are being produced but first i noticed that everyone was smiling when uh, shona lee said that she doesn't give a shit anymore about how the work the work is seen so i wonder if any of you wanted to add to that because i felt like a vibe <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly um, getting there um, and listening to Shana Lee speak uh, so emphatically about it uh, is good. It's good. I, I'm still mm, not in the space where I can say I've fully shrugged it off. I haven't, uh, but, but I know I'll get there. I can see the journey. Fantastic. And I hope that all the female theater makers out there who are watching this right now uh, know that that is the path to go on. <laughs> Just stop giving a shit about um, how your work is perceived when you know that you're doing the right thing. Uh, I noticed that, Kyla, you've unmuted yourself. So I wonder whether you want to add anything. No, yeah, just to to answer that question, uh, may, maybe not. I wouldn't describe it as not giving a shit, but I only recently really embraced what it what it is um, that that I do, that I actually do. 
and and shrugged off this idea of um, oh I'm not this kind of theater maker or I'm not in this particular place that I wanted to be in my career and it, it happened at a performance actually in the rural areas of South Africa in the mountains and we were at this very small school and we were performing for quite a small audience and it, like I guess in the theater landscape it doesn't register you know it's it's not it's not really an event um uh, but but it was real it really was very meaningful right there and in that moment i had this uh profound realization that that this was happening and this is what we do and and i felt in that moment that i fully embraced the style of theater that i do that's fantastic um I'll go back to Shonali now to ask you that question about how involved you are in the rehearsal process as a playwright um, and whether you prefer to be in the room or you, you like to be surprised when you come to the opening night. Um, yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I, I always prefer to be in the room. It's very different depending on the project, though. Like I like, you know, like a lot of a lot of writers, um, my work like spans sort of, I guess, like commissioned work and then sort of uh, work that, that's more through participatory and community theatre and then also work that straddles both, I guess. So um, I always like to be engaged as possible um, and as much as, um, you know, I'm able to. And I also um, continue to write through... Uh, I've got two young children and I've continued to write through both of their uh, like infancies and stuff. And so I've also always been like really keen to take babies into the rehearsal rooms, take toddlers into the rehearsal room. Um, and I've also really actually to go back to your previous question, actually, that, that in itself also has really thrown up some of the best collaborators. You know, when you start to really challenge some of these like extremely sort of restrictive uh, ideas about what the artistic space is like and you know what the you know the sanctity of the creative sphere and actually it just means that some people can't can't participate um and I've just been like well I've got a baby so if you want me to participate the baby is coming and people are cool with that are usually cool in lots of other ways as well <laughs> um so yeah so I like to be as engaged in possible as possible I like to um collaborate as closely as possible um there's always a little bit of a I feel I don't I, I think I think the British theatre culture is particularly ha, maybe has slightly more designated roles than maybe some other some other countries in terms of the director and the writer and there is a certain like um, there, is, there is a certain hierarchy um, but I feel like um, increasingly like younger directors I work with and, and not just younger directors but directors who are interested in um, working on more, I guess, more, more provocative work, uh, want to try and overcome that and want to try and collapse some of those boundaries. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm always really interested in being part of that. And, uh, but equally, I, I, I'm also quite happy that there's usually a point in every project where I'm happy to sort of step away and say, this is the director and the actors now, and I just feel like I'm meddling really. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to Nisha now and ask you about the way that you make work. Um, and in your video, um, you mentioned that the identities that you hold compel you to make political theater and not any other kind of uh, theater. And I wanted to ask you, um, how, how does that change the type of way that you, that you make or how you work? Um, so I think when, when I first started writing and directing, it was really because I felt there weren't a lot of, um, stories or pieces out there that I felt um, spoke to me. Um, I was still sort of discovering who I am and what are these identities that I'm comfortable holding. Uh, but I also saw, saw quite clearly that a lot of it did not speak to me. And I don't mean in just the texts that were done, but also in the manners in which that they were done. Um, yeah, it's also that. But also, I think one thing to understand is that a lot of theater in urban India comes from not everybody is a trained theater practitioner. I'm not. A lot of my uh, learning has come on the job, has been on the rehearsal floor, you know, in, in other directors' rooms. Uh, I've done uh, semi structured programs with mentors. So all of that is there, but it's not the same as a two year, three year, five year program and things like that. So we're also, you know, negotiating a lot of that. 
there are a lot of um, untrained bodies, there are a lot of semi-trained bodies. Um, so there's all kinds of skills and hats that people are wearing just to be able to make this work, right? So as, and so there's also probably some shortcuts that are taken. Um, so when I started making work, I realized fairly early on that all of the provocations that I wanted to toy with uh, directly play into this identity that I hold. So, you know, in the beginning, I remember with my first play, I wanted to, um, I was trying to imagine some myths that were Islamic in um, in its idea. How do I imagine that on stage? And I was writing, of course, but but I didn't have an, an imagery for it. And um, I was stuck there for like a week or two because um, I, I found it very difficult to, uh, to, to find that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an example of an early struggle. Um, today, it's a bit different. Um, and today I find it, uh, you know, I find it, um, I find that my process involves a lot of research, a lot of talking to um, uh, people who, whose experiences I want to bring into these pieces. Um, I also am, you know, a very privileged Muslim in India. Uh, so I, I live in an urban center. I don't live in, an, in a ghettoized area. I don't have the markers of being Muslim apart from my last name. So I, I can get away with a lot of things. I mean, I'm, uh, there may not be, uh, there won't be the kind of blatant discrimination or my bodies on the line or bodies at threat um, in ways that a lot of others or majority of the, my community uh, would be in. So uh, increasingly, my work has involved a lot of research, a lot of talking, just spending time with people, um, really understanding, you know, in, in terms of the themes that I want to work with, either writing or devising, really look at what it is that we're talking about. Like, I, I, I don't live those lives, but I want to responsibly uh, speak about them and use them uh, as means to provoke a conversation in other bubbles, you know. Um, yeah, um, so so there's a lot of research. I think uh, I think 60, 70% of my work really is just research, just talking and meeting people. Um, after that, a lot of it is, so if there is, if it's a play that I'm writing, of course, it's a more um, lone journey until, you know, it's ready to be workshopped by a group of actors. But if it's a device process, then definitely a lot of bringing everybody onto the same page or a similar page, uh, because just the various identities that are there in the room uh, make it difficult to assume a common starting point. So there's a lot of that in the beginning um, of just sharing research material, discussing, talking about how you're feeling about this, what are your thoughts about this, um, so there's a lot of that. Um, some of it is processed in the form of conversation. Some of it is uh, through play, through improv uh, prompts. Um, we're bringing in also uh, working with, with memory, bringing in prompts from personal lives. There's a lot of that. And I think through that is, is when the distance from the source material begins to, to come. And then I'm able to, um, as someone who's facilitating the devising process or as someone who's writing the play, uh, the distance then begins to come then. Um, this is what I've discovered so far, but I'm only four productions old as a maker. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what more this could be. Um, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. It's such an incredible making process that you have. Um, and I wanted to ask you more about your process of research. So you say that you start by interviewing and talking to people um, and then you take the material to the rehearsal room. Do you ever feed back to the people that you were talked to or do you try to bring the shows in that community? How exactly does it work? Yes, with the devised pieces, I've been able to do that. Uh, but with the, uh, with, with the other, uh, you know, the play, the playwriting, the text, no, I haven't. There's also the problem of language in, in some cases. Um, so sometimes um, I, I also have access to a couple of different languages. Um, you know, English being, of course, the most uh, urban and universal in the urban context. But there's also uh, some other native languages that I can um, 
either make work in or at least direct translations of because I understand it very well. So there's all of these complications when it comes to taking work into uh, the community. But I have to say that the one time that I said, you know, I'm going to chuck language because I want to be able to go beyond the politics of language. And that became like a form decision right up front. Um, in that case, we, you know, we decided we took a call very early that it's going to be a nonverbal play at max, there might be words or maybe some, you know, gibberish, if at all. So every word, you know, that was remotely text had to earn its place, you know, um, and that really helped because that allowed me to take it to spaces. Uh, this is the, the, the theater for young audience one. Uh, it allowed me to take it to spaces that otherwise would not have opened up for me. And that was a, it was a mind blowing experience to be able to take it back um, into the community because a lot of the prompts that we were working with and a lot of the incidences, you know, the inciting incidences on the, on the rehearsal floor came from the community. So to take it back and then for, 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 you know, for teenagers to say, ah, you know, that's me. How did you know, you know, um, was brilliant. And it, and it came back, it came back into the play and it, and it, helped the play you know shape itself um yeah yeah i think that's that's excellent how um where you want to take the show and who you want to speak to has actually influenced what the play will be and mm. we will we will get to the audience um category of questions in a bit i just want to ask one final question which is directed to all of you so anyone feel free to an to answer um it's something that i often think about that if 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 a piece of work um is political in its nature but then it doesn't uh respect its own I ideology and politics in in the making so it's maybe not hierarchical it's hierarchical or the wrong people are making it. Is that truly political theater? I would say no. <laughs> and I would say that although the production is always important, the process is just as important. And the, um, like, I think there can be, I think, that, I think one of the worst things is to go and see a show where you feel like there's a lot of grandstanding um, and it's really about a sort of, a, I guess, a sort of a super, superficial posing where, whereas you know, actually the, the politics being represented on stage are sort of superficial. Um, that, that to me, is, I'd rather go and see a show that has, has no political subject matter at all, but was made in a really sort of, you know, non-hierarchical collective way that, that in lots of ways that would be more exciting if, if those were the options for me. Uh, if I can I think intervene. <laughs> Um, I think this is also a process in itself, uh, developing the working method and uh, a group within which everything uh, is more horizontal. I mean, I have learned a lot from my earlier projects where, let's say, the intentions were good, but then uh, somehow we ended up being a bit exploitative or a bit... Uh, representational of other people instead of giving a voice to them and I really I really did learn a lot and reflected a lot with uh, my peers from these projects and I think we all had to so many things to learn about how we want to do things in the future uh, and yeah I think even criticism to such projects should be brought kindly uh, because we are yeah we all do have good intentions but we also live in in a context in which so many of these stories are instrumentalized to yeah to do all sorts of art washing uh, and we're we're only learning how to do it better by doing it yeah i i, I love this so le learning by doing um that's certainly what happened for us and we've been touring for 10 years now um, and this is one of the things that we learned early on. Um, so we cannot be an ecological justice theater company talking about environmental issues and not be walking that talk ourselves. Um, and, and, and so it's now part of our ethos that, that the way in which we make the shows is aligned with the theme of the shows as well. So for example, with our show Plastocracy, nothing new was bought. We're talking about like throwaway culture. So nothing new was bought. Everything was reclaimed, repurposed, reused. Um, and so that's just obviously a, a, 
a very practical example, but something that we also learned that goes along with this topic is that for us, the show begins as soon as the company arrives in the space. From the moment that you speak to the security guards, there's a lot of security guards in South Africa, <laughs> usually blocking access to places. But from the moment you engage with that first person, you know, the, the, the show has begun, the company is, has arrived. And I think a lot can be said for a company that doesn't treat those uh, steps towards the stage with uh, respect and with um, humanity. Um, because yeah, for, for us, it's like what happens on the stage is merely the culmination. It's not, it's, it's not the whole thing. So I absolutely agree. Thank you. Nisha, I think you wanted to add something. Um, that's just a really great way of, of putting it across, Skyla. Um, so much resonance. Um, um, th this, this thing of, you know, uh, this, you know, who are the, what are the ideologies or what, what is the politics in the room is something that I've been thinking about a lot more uh, in, in the last, I think, um, one and a half odd years. In fact, the pandemic and, and that, that, you know, forced break also made me really think about this. Um, there is a, a lot of a polarization even within the theater community um, in, in the city I work in and even otherwise in other urban centers in India. And um, I think I've, I've really clearly sort of drawn a boundary for myself, but also as the director in the room um, to make sure that the others, whether they hold these identities that are marginalized or not, uh, they are allying uh, or they're collaborating to to, you know, in service of this play. And so they also, as allies, need to feel safe. Uh, so so it's, it's getting very clear for me what those boundaries are. Um, as a dramaturg, I've had to negotiate this a bit because I'm not the director in the room and I'm not taking calls on collaborators and things like that. But, uh, but then I'm the dramaturg in the room. So, you know, what are my lines there? Um, what, what is it that... Where is it that I'm saying that, no, I'm not going to be part of this project for these reasons? Just to be able to say it out loud itself seems, um, you know, very liberating um, to say that this is a concern and I will foreground this is itself feeling like quite a liberation, really. Absolutely. I, I wanted to ask you a bit more about what you mentioned um, um, about creating boundaries. Can you give us an example of how you create boundaries? Um, so one that um, one that specifically I've put in place in my rehearsal room is um, after the Me Too movement happened, um, my my you know floor work. I mean, my rehearsals typically have more non male members. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, break the, the hierarchical nature of, of working in, in Indian rehearsal rooms. A lot of them are, you know, are led by males. I've been in rooms that are led by older men, um, you know, who have caste privilege and therefore there is a certain politics that come with that. So uh, to, to not have... Um, to not know what the other, the, the alternative is, but to keep kind of wrestling with what it is, to speak to other women, you know, who are makers, who are leading rooms and look at what have you done here? What have I done here? So after the Me Too happened, um, I decided that it was time to do something in the rehearsal room where uh, as, a, as, a, as a director, I am held accountable. So there's someone that is always um, uh, associated with the with each production, where this person's this person would be a therapist or someone who can who they can approach in case of any issue uh, related to abuse or harassment in the room, uh, me included. And this person's um, details are shared in our our chat rooms uh, before we begin rehearsals, and this person becomes the go-to point. Of course, the option remains with, you know, every member of the team to come to me first if they'd like, but what happens if I am the abuser in the room? Uh, so, so, so they needed to have, you know, to, to have that, there needs to be that. Uh, I don't know if this 
process is foolproof because I've not faced the other side. No one's actually reported anything. So I think the the strength of it really, I'll know only when, or we'll all will know only if, you know, if we have to deal with it. But it seemed like a, a, a step in the right direction. Um, and I know that it made a difference for, for example, the queer members in the in in the rehearsal room. Um, you know, and it, I know that it, we started off on the right note. We started off on the note where everyone is aware that, you know, all kinds of safeties are being thought of. And if it isn't, then, you know, you can bring it up was a good note to start on. Um, the other is, of course, is political alignment. I mean, if I'm going to be creating a, a, a play that is about um, asserting uh, a non-dominant uh, identity on stage, then who, you know, who's in my crew, who's in my tech, uh, I, I'm, 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 you know, vetoing out people because I know the kinds of um, uh, values they hold will not fit in this rehearsal room. So they might be fabulous at their work. They might be my first choice if it was only skill based, but mm -mm, you're, you're not going to be in my room. I'm not going to legitimize um, your political views against Muslims, against queers, against whoever it is that it's not going to happen, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, again, like I said, it, it, it took me time to to know that it's OK to do this, that it's not some kind of um, you know, relegation from my role as an artist, you know, it took me time to discover that. I wish I had discovered it earlier. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it takes a lot of strength um, to, to do that and to choose the person who is right for the project rather than the best person for the job. And to, first of all, um, put the psychological well-being of your collaborators on, you know, that's the, the, the highest priority. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's very inspiring. Um, I'd like to now shift a little bit towards the audience um, and your relationship with the audience and how um, your work has been received. And I wanted to ask Joe, first of all, to start with you. Um, Elena, one of the teenagers, uh, she mentions that actually there have been some negative reactions to your shows when you've been touring. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Uh, sure. The tours uh, were mostly in rural areas around the Tudhunans. And as I mentioned before, it's quite a conservative area. And one of the scenes, uh, I suppose that uh, one of the teenagers is traveling back in time, meeting her mom uh, when she was trying to decide whether to give birth to her. And it's this very touching uh, scene in which the daughter goes back into the past and uh, tells her that she is free to do whatever she wants. And for us, this was a very liberatory thing, including, uh, yeah, for our relationships with our mother and vice versa. Just uh, letting go of control and ownership over somebody else's life and body uh, and encouraging a woman to, to choose for herself. And of course, that was uh, criticized at the end uh, because, yeah, it just goes completely against uh, many of the values here. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's so maybe that maybe so we powerful. also included this like layer of provocation unconsciously to make it more strong. So yeah, if uh, if something is really important for us, then uh, it's also okay to go against the current and make the audience uncomfortable. Absolutely. And and for it to come from the child as well, I think it's even more powerful. The child have, you know, coming from a completely different point of view and saying, yeah, you can choose not to have me because it will be better for your life. I think that is so powerful. And actually, um, I think that even negative reactions are important for this type of work um, because even though that person may say that they disagree, I feel like something has been touched and at least it started a conversation. Um, I'd, like it, I'd like to um, ask you, how did the teenagers react to that? How do they feel about the negative reaction um, they received? as artists, because I mean, we're all artists and we, you know, we all feel um, it we feel it really deeply when we're criticized. So how did they take it? Well, because we had a quite compact group and uh, they were trustful of each other, uh, then they could easily say, like use this common voice and say, no, we believe he's in these things. And we had throughout the process, of course, we had all sorts of 
of discussions and deconstructions of ways in which we perceive things. Uh, so they were really ready, I think, to, to respond to all sorts of criticism. But of course, they also got really positive feedback and encouragement. <laughs> Of course. Um, I wanted to open up to everyone else. Um, maybe start with you, Nisha, if you've faced any sort of black backlash or negative feedback um, in your work. Sure, I mean, for sure. Um, but if you're asking specifically because of the content of, uh, of ah, okay. So um, with the, the, the written text, of course there was, um, there was feedback to the to the tune of do you have to uh, be so um, specific do you have to be so do you have to shout so much about about some of this uh, so um, tone policing is something that i have uh, dealt with um, as as you know as as a writer um, but i think if there's a backlash it's been more uh, in the school um, space, I think. Um, there has definitely been an impact on some of the spaces that I used to work with before. Uh, when, you know, when, for example, they uh, can access a very public social media profile and they see some of the things that I've either been involved in or I'm putting out there, uh, there has been um, some backlash about things like that. Um, you know, some some uh, policing about, okay, I don't want you to talk about this or I don't want you to deal with this in the classroom, but you can do that. And um, uh, it, it's disturbing. And a lot of it has to do with um, fear that my, you know, the identity that I hold will be used to, you know, uh, to, to push an agenda of some kind. Um, and so I have spent... Uh, in cases where I feel like um, I'm okay to do so, I have spent time explaining that that is not what my work with youth is about. Um, but in other cases, I've just let it go because in some spaces it comes with a top-down history of uh, not wanting, wanting to engage uh, with these themes or with these topics, especially in a school um, or a community center kind of a kind of a uh, context, you know, uh, either school um, principals or teachers or community ma space managers are worried about how to explain this to parents. And um, I'll try once, I'll say, look, that's exactly why you need to do this. And a lot of it will come from the children themselves. You've got to trust the process, right? I'm not, I'm not putting anything on them. A lot, it's all going to come from this, from the kids. And if, and if the, if the teenagers are are open to so much that's out there in the world, you can't, you can't. How long can you police them? But in some cases, I just let it go. It's just not worth. Um, I know that it's not going to make a difference. But yeah, mostly in these, in these cases, there has been backlash of this kind. So it's difficult to really pinpoint and say that, hey, you know, I see what you're doing, but I know it's present. It reaches you, you know, it reaches you through others in the community and yeah. I'd like to open it up um, to you, uh, Shona Lee and Kyla. Um, how do you uh, resist backlash publicly? So have you ever been attacked for the things that you've written or, or made? And also how do you deal with it personally as a human being? Um, I can yeah I can jump in. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've ever been um, directly attacked for the content of anything that I've written. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but particularly, actually, particularly early on in my career, something about being a bit younger, I guess. Um, I, I felt like I was attacked just for simply being an Asian woman writing, <laughs> and that's just the very like very knee jerk, just racist sort of patriarchal response basically um and actually I probably was more noticeable if I was so um I remember I had so there's two things particularly that, that stand out that I had a, a radio commission on the BBC so of course the BBC is a very you know is quite a mainstream platform and so I think that the that you know some some really hostile this is pre-social media though so it would have been much worse if it was on Twitter but you know you can leave comments and there were just some just some openly just sort of racist misogynistic comments about and the, the essentially was like what how dare you be on this platform um and then I guess also 
um, I had a, around, probably around the same time, had a play on that was also went to Edinburgh and it was on, you know, it was sort of, I think it, it's more, so it's not so much about content, it's actually just about um, trying to, which I'm sure we've all experienced, like that, just trying to suppress your voice, like, you know, even sort of like having a platform to say anything is seen as, um, as uh, transgressive and seen as uh, threatening. Um, but I mean, but, but probably come from very reactionary sections of British society. So I don't know if I don't know how reflective they are, but this is just, I think like, it's something we probably are really aware of now as social media is so part of our lives. We know as women that we are, um, you know, much more, uh, well, I guess our experience in real life is, is, is sort of, you know, has a parallel in social media. And so, um, but not so much for the content. I feel like the content is more about um, being able to get your work made. It more, it's more about that, you know, that process is probably harder. Carla, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I guess I have a slightly uh, different experience in that um, with uh, kind of ecological issues, they're quite science heavy. Um, and also, um, I think, can feel quite distant, like nobody really wants to place themselves at the center of these enormous interconnected problems that feel too big to even tackle uh, by on mass, never mind individually, which is true. Um, so I feel like a lot of how our work has been less about trying to kind of uh, uh, push back and more about trying to draw in <laughs> and trying to help audiences to see themselves as part of the, the picture. So, so when you talk about like, what is the audience backlash you've experienced? Uh, the biggest thing is we've experienced this thing of like, it's not me. It's not me. Uh, I, I This is not my problem. There's nothing I can do. It's somebody else's thing. Um, I'm not the bad guy here. And, and, and so it's, it's been, that, that has been very much part of our journeys. How do we pull people in? So uh, in an empathetic and compassionate way, it, it, so that we can start to see ourselves as part of the story without this kind of defensiveness that happens around environmental issues where, uh, because they can also, obviously the environmental movement can, can be, and our plays have also been quite preachy. Um, this is also something that we are very cognizant of and working on, you know, this kind of high horse, um, you must do this, you shall do that according to the book of the green or whatever. So it's like, you know, trying to get rid of that and be like, well, what is the, what is the, um, the story that we can tell ourselves in order to approach this, these, these issues from a collective rather than a, the government has to do something about it. My neighbor has to do something about it. It's my parents' fault. It's uh, the next generation's um, problem. So yeah, when, I would say that's been our major challenge with audiences over the years, um, yeah. Thank you. That actually moves me on to the next question I wanted to ask you, um, which is how in this in this subject of climate justice, um, I, I, I could uh, I could guess that there's a lot of resistance to the subject matter. And also, um, I found that there's a lot of uh, fatigue in relation to this subject. And I wonder whether it's the same in South Africa and if you've had to deal with that with people like, oh, not the polar bears again. Yeah, in South Africa, it's less about the, the polar bears and more about uh, energy. Um, we're a mining com country, you know, we're, we're a country that's built its wealth on pulling things out of the ground and burning them <laughs> for, for, cheap, for cheap energy that has served the elite few, uh, read white, the, the white um, population historically. Um, so the fatigue, I think, is probably more around that than climate justice as a, as a theme. And now what's happening, oh, sorry, there's a dog barking out there. Um, the, 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 what's, what's happening is um, climate justice is now being inserted into those issues um, in a way that it hasn't previously been. So, I, I mean, I did live in the UK for, for 10 years and it does have a very different feel there. And I can understand the idea of uh, fatigue there because it does feel like quite an individual problem. Like you alone are responsible for climate change and your solution, your 
your actions alone are going to fix this. Whereas in South Africa, it's it seems like it's a bit more of a collective. Um, people understand that it's a little bit more dispersed, the problem. Um, so yeah, this, this question of fatigue, when it, it's not only climate justice, it's also environmental issues in general. And, and you're absolutely right. There is the sense of what can I do? You know, where can I start? Um, it's too much. It's too much. And, and in South Africa in particular, it's very low down on the agenda um, underneath, uh, rightly so, underneath um, uh, uh, femicide and crime and poverty and um, jobs and employment. It's very low down on the list and is seen traditionally as a sort of white liberal issue. Um, so that is that is a challenge, like how to how to I don't want to say convince because we've done with that now. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> but um, gently suggest that it is not low down uh, on the list and, and is in fact, um, as you say, intersects with with all of the above. Um, yeah, and to try and do that in a way that does not provoke this defensiveness that I spoke about and this like I actually can't deal you know I, I can't deal right now can't think about the environment I'm too busy thinking about me and my family and how we're going to survive the month basically and I guess the best way we've found to do that is with humor honestly speaking humor and satire and uh, poking fun at things. And uh, I mean, for me, this is the heart opens wide then, right? And there's this sense immediately of humanity of, okay, you're not blaming me, great. Okay, now we can talk about it. <laughs> so this is very much a, a, a weapon of ours is humor and um, imagery, you know, physical imagery and uh, things that are not so cerebral or intellectual, but more embodied and, and work in on the heart rather than the head. Um, yeah, let me stop there. No, thank you. Thank you. And that actually will um, connect uh, a lot with the next um, the next subject, which is intersectionality and how we try uh, to uh, connect the issues that we speak about to other issues in society. But before we move uh, to that, I, I have one last question about audience and that's for Shonali. And I wanted to ask you as, as a playwright, I'm, I'm asking you this question because I'm more familiar with um, the work in the UK and I, I'm curious how you do it. How do you decide who your work is for and who your audience is? And um, when you make political theater, do you decide to talk to the majority, to the people in power to change their minds or, or do you want more to empower individual um, communities? This is such a good question. And after I recorded my uh, piece, which you asked uh, us to do uh, the, before this process, is something I was thinking about, actually. I didn't talk about audience. And I was thinking, I hope they ask me about audience, because actually that is probably the fourth element of political theatre, which I think is so important. Um, so um, I think it's really important not to write for an assumed audience. Um, I cannot stand it when I go to the theatre and I know that the audience, the intended audience is not me. And it's hardly ever me, actually. It's almost always seems like, you know, quite a sort of a reactionary, pale male, stale sort of uh, audience member. And it's like, well, what, what is the point of this? Like, you know, like, I don't need you to tell me, you know, we, oh my God, this person experienced racism. And it's like, and everyone's supposed to go, <gasps> and it's like, well, no person of color in the audience is gonna go, <gasps> because that's just not, it doesn't relate to our lives in any way. It's, it, it's, it goes back again to the boring work that I, that I mentioned. Um, so no, I never assume, uh, I don't tend to assume a majority audience. I often think um, this is unfortunately increasingly relevant here, uh, much more relevant for some of you than probably in the UK as well. I mean, like Nisha, you're really on the front line in India, but increasingly we have an increasingly authoritarian, hard right society, the government really mask off. Um, and I think a lot about how um, I've heard sort of like comrades and artists and, and writers from other countries who've sort of been been through periods of authoritarianism and fascism and they've talked about how that has impacted on them in, on a very personal level and um, what's something that's really stuck with me um, was an Italian writer um, speaking at the beginning of the pandemic actually last year and he was talking about how um, that um, through like the years of Mussolini he felt like people um, 
thought that their neighbours had very scary fascist views. So they kept their actually considerably more progressive <laughs> Um, and collective and humanist, you know, human views to themselves because they didn't want to be. But actually, um, as, as, as that regime sort of um, sort of ended, um, people increasingly realised that they were not alone in their communities. But the atomizing effects of, of, of authoritarianism and the, you know the fear and the division had, had had separated them. And so I think about that a lot. That you know, I never, you know, I don't want to write for that the assumed audience. I want to write as if people um you know need to feel have have that, that feeling unlocked i guess um so yeah i essentially i mean selfish i guess always right for me but um, always right for an audience a bit like me um and also um uh i think ultimately um i'm always very wary of not of trying not to like educate or explain anything of just trying to meet people as if they they understand. So just uh, uh, assume that people understand or assume if people don't understand that they'll very quickly be able to understand. And above all, my responsibility as a theatre maker and as an artist is just to write a like, bloody brilliant play. Uh, and that actually supersedes everything. And, once, and it goes a bit to what Kyla was saying about, you know, putting people in with humour and, and, and um, with satire. And I think that that's, that's absolutely right. It's about, you know, you welcome people in and um you write a, you write a, 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 you know you write a fantastic you write you write as good a play as you're able to write and that you know that that people appreciate that and then they they will yeah they'll they'll follow you on whatever journey you take them on hopefully thank you um claire's just yeah, told no, me that you, yes do you think i could respond to that a little i just wanted to absolutely absolutely please please um you know it, it's um it's something that uh a lot of us here, especially in urban centers in Bangalore, we think about often because uh, spaces where we can perform our, our plays at um, are, are limited. And there is a lot of, um, you know, specific cast and class uh, of people who can come into those spaces, who feel like they can enter these spaces. And there's also my, you know, intersectional identity um, because of the, kind of spaces that I can access, I'm also able to directly ask questions of silences, of complicity. And negotiating this is uh, sometimes can be a bit um, debilitating in, in, the, in the writing process also. And I have to kind of consciously uh, work, wrestle with that because of course you want to make the, you know, you want to write the best kind of Play that you can write and you you want to make on the devising floor you want to make the best kind of work that you can but this question is always present and i don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing that who is going to be coming and watching right because i know the spaces that that i will have to necessarily apply to to um to to reach an audience there is also the other way of looking at it, which is I'm not going to go down that route I'm going to create my own spaces right um Yes, but even then there is gatekeeping that happens. So if I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, what, you know, anti, um, uh, anti Muslim sentiment or anti caste sentiment, then I, I want to be speaking to the people who belong to the communities that uh, have the most privilege and can be quiet about it. And, you know, and yet that's where there is, you know, the most amount of gatekeeping. So so negotiating all of this is is itself um, quite something, um, simply because spaces you know are are political. The space that you that you um, create your piece in, that you showcase your piece in, they're all political choices. The language, especially in in India, the language is deeply political. The minute I I make a play in English, um, I know that this is open to a certain audience, and so with it comes a certain uh, audience that you're creating for as well it, it's kind of inbuilt in that. um so it's interesting to to hear shanali's um perspective um yeah yeah i just i just wanted to think out loud um Absolutely. I think I think it's important to for, for all of us to understand that uh, individual contexts are different in each country. And for example, in the UK, um, I definitely feel what Shonali is saying, because um, work seems to be 
and I, I say this as a woman and as a migrant, I say about us, you know, kind of like as an object rather than uh, work that is truly for us. And I say this as a migrant as a, and as a woman. Um, uh, but at the same time, yes, certain spaces will be completely white or, or uh, you know, completely middle class. Um, and, and that is that is true. And, and that is one 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 thing I wonder about. How do we change these spaces? And um, it's actually a, a question that I want to address to everyone that at least in the UK, and I'm sure everywhere, some large spaces are trying to clean their image by by programming work. Uh, that may be very representative, for example, but actually it won't really rock the boat. Their politics won't be very hard hitting. And I wonder as women, uh, some of us as migrants, some of us um, as uh, holding other identities that make us more marginalized, um, how do we fight for representation and without allowing our identities to be objectified for art washing? Sorry, that was a very long winded question. <laughs> Feel free, anyone to to jump in, or if you'd rather not answer, we I can skip. <laughs> it's it's a great question, and I think the only I have a very short answer. the The only ways in which that I can um, you know make sense of this is to just continue working independently. A lot of us in in India work independently because there is no institutional support to speak of, and in doing that, we we find our own ways of of keeping this alive. Um, you know, funding through patrons, finding your own spaces, uh, literally uh, knowing that the constraints you're working with, uh, formally speaking as well, uh, could be, you know, mm, little black boxes made out of non-performing spaces. Therefore, with it come certain choices. Um, and, and that's the only way that I think a lot of us here have uh, found to, to, to deal with some of this. Just make your own spaces and you know find your own patrons and it's hard as hell um and it definitely slows things down um for a lot of us but in some ways it seems more acceptable uh to me than having to um, spend energies convincing i don't know other other spaces people that um this is worth it i I don't know, it sounds a bit, um, sounds a bit arrogant, I think, but uh, it just comes from the need to put work out there and do it at, at on your own terms. Yeah. I think it sounds very reasonable and not arrogant at all. <laughs> um, I think this is kind of a, um, a connected question and it leads us to the subject of the place of political theater, but um, because some, so many of us cannot literally get a seat at the table in this industry that is so male and so middle-class and so white, um, how do we actually reform it um, if we can't reach those spaces? That is a question for everyone and more of a reflection, really. I know we can't, find the solution now. <laughs> I don't necessarily have an answer, but I'm really, really keen for us as a, as a, as a group of like a sector to, to start organising and to start seeing ourselves as workers more than we do at the moment. I mean, certainly British theatre culture is like, like so many, I guess, all, the entire creative sector is built on a sense of individualism and a sense of, you know, I've talked about how grateful we're supposed to feel to be here, especially if we're not from very privileged backgrounds. Um, but really erodes the fact that we put in our time and our effort and our work <laughs> and that we're workers and that we wouldn't, you know, that I've got a, I've got a good, a good friend who's an actor and uh, his union are, are fighting for a five day week. You know, like the rest of us are trying, starting to talk about a four day week is like, we just want a five day week. And it's like, yes, exactly. That's the issue. Um, so I'm really keen to, to sort of start thinking about that and. Um, I've, you know, I'm really excited, like, for instance, that the, um, the uh, unions like UVW have got like a design and culture uh, sector workers sort of section now. And um, I'm really interested in, in, in sort of exploring how we both organise as, as sort of theatre workers, but also how we all see, uh, recognise that we are precarious workers and that we have, you know, we can be organising in solidarity with, with other precarious workers and that there is massive overlap there. And um, and, and that um, part and parcel of that has to be breaking down that hierarchy about who gets to 
you know, who gets to participate in theatre and culture and who gets to make this work, you know, um, and I'm, I, I certainly don't have the answers, but I, I'm really, I feel like we need to fast forward on some of this organising and some of these discussions in order to start doing sort of this, this sort of collective thinking. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? Jo. Yeah, uh, for me, it's a lot about decentralizing, not just methods and voices and so on, but also the places where we choose to, to do our work. For instance, for me, it was quite a big step to move from Bucharest to Tugunans. Bucharest, where there is a local scene and there is some uh, formed public already, including for political theater. And moving here where there's almost nothing happening and implicitly there's the people don't have any expectations from, uh, from theater in general. So maybe many of the people that we reached, uh, it was their first performance. Uh, so then we're just dealing with a blank page, uh, which can be, I mean, yeah, of course it requires so much more work and effort, but uh, that kind of work, it's not, deconstructive it's more constructive if you start from something um and then they they don't have a term of comparison so they're not going to say classical theater is better uh they just take it as it is and then consider it for what it is and i'm sure that this area is not the only one where you know the public hasn't had the chance to to see a performance and to be asked what do you think about this given subject exactly and actually that's something i wanted to discuss with all of you this idea of art with a capital a and how sometimes that is seen as antithetic to political theater and as political artists we have to really dance around that line and i wonder how how you do that in your work this is towards all of you mm, if if i can say something about that and it is it does definitely relate back to uh what we were just talking about uh, so many resonances there um, in terms of um, what Shonali said about making a good play, first and foremost, um, and also what Nisha said about um, making your own spaces or sidestepping some of the bureaucracy of theatre, which is what it feels like sometimes, and also the idea of decentralising. I mean, I resonate with all of these. I think they are really great points and certainly something that we've come to as well. Um, uh, we, we think that um, a, a way to, to, to carve out space for this kind of work in, in our industry is to keep making it, <laughs> to keep making it and for, for every play to be better than the last and more popular than the last and to go to places that haven't seen work like this and just to keep like uh, pushing those uh, to pioneer basically to keep pushing pushing outwards rather than trying to beg for a seat at this table where everyone's clamoring and that is definitely the man the men at the gate certainly in south africa it's like the the gatekeepers are these big powerful very patriarchal um uh, people and systems that that are definitely don't want you and this kind of work at the table. So then, you know, we we don't expend energy on knocking on those doors anymore. We just turn around and go the other direction and we keep making the work and we keep making the work as entertaining and interesting and provocative and inspiring and unusual and unique and different as possible. And we keep performing it for more new and new and new audiences so that, um, yeah, we, 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 we therefore going uh, outwards rather than inwards, I guess. Uh, we're not trying to repeat what happened in the past, but we're trying to make new because that is also what we're about, right? We are about making a new way. You know, I, I love this, this idea of like, uh, if, you, if you don't like me take, taking my baby into the rehearsal room, well, then you also don't know me and, and you don't know me as an artist because I'm inseparable. My, the fact that I'm a mother is inseparable from the fact that I'm also a theater maker. We come together and this is how we do things now. And this is the normal way, um, not your way. This is the normal way. So yeah, that, that, that's what I have to say about those two things, you know, like how do we make art? We, we, we make it, 
we make it like this now and and also the idea of how do we um uh yeah fight fight back against this thing that hopes to exclude us thank you very much um unfortunately i have to start wrapping up i have so many questions for all of you i have learned so much um in in this in this uh, discussion and I'm so in awe and I have so much respect for everything that all of you do. Um, but before we end, I wanted, uh, first of all, to uh, offer you the opportunity to ask each other questions if you want uh, to talk more uh, to each other. Um, and then uh, towards the end, I would like you to tell our audience what you're working on at the moment, what your future plans are and how um, our audience can help you, support you, spread the word about your work. Um, so feel free, uh, whichever one of you wants to start. I have a question for Kyla um, and actually and Joe, uh, both of you, um, do you, what do you do, you know, before and after the, the actual show to kind of prep um, the people that are going to be viewing it, uh, specifically because of uh, some of the work that you discussed, Joe and Kyla, because you spoke about some amount of fatigue or some amount of this isn't my problem. Um, is there, you know, how do you do that? How do you prep an audience to receive some of what you're going to be telling them, especially if it's provocative, if it's, um, if it's dark, if, it's, if it requires them to really wrestle with themselves? Because mm -hmm. that's something you know, I think about a lot and yeah. We always do have an introduction uh, in which we talk about the working process. So we don't just throw the audience into the experience, uh, especially since, as I mentioned, many of them maybe haven't seen the theater performance. And we also have uh, an, a discussion afterwards, uh, which is moderated and which, yeah, again, we come back to the working process and to be as transparent as possible about that. And uh, I think it's part of, it's, it's an integral part of, uh, of what we present. Yeah, um, anyone is, else? Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is a great question and something that I also think about a lot, um, especially because we do visit a lot of schools. Certainly the last three years we've been working um, with uh, various age groups at schools. And what we have been trying to do is for the, the educators to do that prep beforehand. So, for example, if we're talking about water issues, um, that they talk about that in class um, and then say that there is a play coming, um, it's about this. And then usually what happens is we also have a, a talk back session after the play where we try to, to steer the conversation away from how old are you? <laughs> What, how did you become an actor and more towards the actual meat of the, of the performance, um, which is, again, an interesting conversation about, especially if you are going to places that haven't seen a lot of theater before, how do you hold those two things, the art and the experience, the theatrical experience and the novelty of that with the subject matter. There's a lot going on for audience members sometimes, especially young audience members. So, but but I, I will say that I'm dissatisfied with this, I, and I'm looking for new ways in which to allow the the production to sit um, and to land. And I, I'm yeah, I'm 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 dissatisfied with the sort of like bookmarking, you know. Um, and I'm wondering what else what else is possible. Yeah, yeah, we should uh, we should continue the conversation because I've been thinking about what else is possible too. It just seems like there should be other ways and I feel like I haven't or we haven't cracked it yet. Yeah. One more thing that I'd like to add to this uh, is that I think especially when we talk about more marginal publics um, I think it's important to come back and to return and mm -hmm. uh, if once they've seen one performance then yeah maybe it's not enough to make up mm -hmm. your mind or to take some action but coming back also, I think, kind of gives the message that uh, you matter. And even mm. if it does take some extra work from the company to go that extra mile, we do it because you're also yeah, concerned about <laughs> these things that happen. And you can also 
make a, an impact, even if you live in rural, you name it. This, this has worked for, for um, the Theatre for Youth production that we were touring with before the pandemic hit. It did work for us, yes. Um, going back and, and also volunteering sessions with the, um, with the government school kids. With the, with the government school is like the public school equivalent, except it's um, specifically for, well, not specifically for, but typically the, uh, the kids that go there are of marginalized identities. It, schooling is very segregated in, in India. It's a, um, it's a legacy of the caste system. It's a legacy of the colonial reality. So all of that. Um, and going back, it did, it, it did do something. And we volunteered sessions with um, the group and it opened up both uh, what Kyla was talking about, both the spaces, you know, the questions around the artistry and questions around what the content was, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really important what, what Joe said as well about coming back and, and uh, especially if you go to a, to a community or if you um, collect uh, research from, from that specific community for you to come back to it and not just use them as a source. Um, and this and actually, Shonali, in your video, you speak so beautifully about art and activism and how um, our work is fused. Uh, but there's also the conflict with us see, being seen as workers. It's, and I know we won't have time to debate this. I think, feel like there should be a conversation just about like an hour on this subject about how, how do we protect ourselves as workers, but also when our work is actually activism, how do we get, you know, getting paid for activism and, and things like that. So uh, it's, I just, it's just made me ask myself a lot of questions and I hope that it would have sparked uh, uh, questions and thoughts for our audiences as well. Um, and now we, I really have to, to wrap up. So please tell me, what, what are you working on at the moment, Shonali? What, what are we uh, looking forward to? Um, yeah, I'm working on some, some really awesome uh, projects I'm really enjoying at the moment. Um, so uh, one that um, people can actually book for um, and see, because it will be live streamed um, in the next few weeks, um, is a short commission for the Orange Tree um, who are who've commissioned uh, I think six of us to mark the reopening of their doors who knows what's going to happen I mean they thought they'd be reopening their doors I think they will I think they will be um, but they'll be live streamed so I think that there's you know they've been quite sensible about that um, I've, I've got another couple of commissions coming up um, I'm working for the Almeida at the moment um, I'm writing a play for uh, Tower Arts um, and um, there's been some exciting developments with um, a play called Chasing Hairs that I wrote as well, which is um, uh, set in Kolkata in about 20 years ago and in Britain like now. Um, so, um, yeah, but no sort of announcements around that yet. But if people are interested in uh, yeah, booking, it's called Inside Out for the Orange Tree. I'll, I'll post a link in the, in the uh, chat here to share. Thank you. I'm sure the link is now here for our audiences to click on through some sort of tech magic that I do not fully understand. Uh, I've just muted myself. Nisha, what are you working on? Um, so I'm uh, right now on the floor with two others um, and we, um, we're we all sort of imagining, devising, performing together. I go back on the floor as a performer after five years and it's nerve wracking as hell. Um, but we're there, we're doing it. Um, all three of us hold um, intersexual identities that um, have been marginalized and we're bringing uh, personal history, family history, community history, um, and, and kind of weaving um, what we hope would be deeply unsettling experience. <laughs> it's not going to be live streamed. We took the call to not do that. Um, we wanted to work with shared space. And we have sort of taken a call to actively look at um, what are those uh, spaces that we can perform in that is going to break, at least try to break some of these bubbles, you know, that exist. Um, that's the attempt, um, you know, you wish us luck. I hope we get there. But the piece itself is something that um, looks at what does it take for um, in a supremacist dominant culture? How does, what does assertion look like? And, and how does one move beyond mere questions of survival really? Um, and that's really what we're looking at. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Joe, what are you working on? Well, there's one uh, short variant of the answer, which is, of course, funding applications. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, there's the creative and exciting part in which we're working on a musical performance about future because uh, Cheva, which means something, also stands for community, education, future and art. And we thought that every edition we're going to dedicate one of these subjects, which of course is treated quite intersectionally. Uh, so yeah, future as dystopia, utopia, imagined spaces, and so on, uh, is like, yeah, we're doing a performance on this. And uh, we're also preparing a festival for other teenager theater groups, which is also very exciting and also a lot of work because we're doing it with a bunch of teenagers who have never been to a theater festival. We are going to organize one for other teenagers. So it's really an very fertile ground to imagine and create experiences uh, for one another. That's fantastic. Kyla, what are you working on? I, I love a dystopian political <laughs> theater piece. I wish I could see it. Um, yes, uh, we. I'm actually working on a school with some colleagues. It's called the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement Theater. We all have similar training in devised theater. Um, and I guess I'm mentioning it because we have had specific conversations around how do we train theater makers, not, uh, not only actors, or, um, but, but also uh, the theater makers, uh, those who make theater, which is also writers, directors, um, designers. So we've been working on that throughout the pandemic. We've been um, working on a curriculum and we've just got our first workshops uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, some weekend workshops. Um, as I said in my, my video, I, we really str have a struggle with the digital, the kind of imposed digital age. We are very much a live company um, and we've been, we're just coming out of a lockdown now here in South Africa. So I guess we also, I'm, I'm trying to reimagine how we can get back to the liveness of things without putting people in danger, putting ourselves in danger. Um, and other than that, uh, we, we want to revisit our piece, Burning Rebellion, which is a climate justice protest poem, the choral work that I mentioned. Um, so slow steps towards that, I guess. But I guess the biggest thing is the school. And, and I mean, I think what would be helpful for us is for people to follow us on all the places, a well-worn theater company. Um, we're on all the feeds and then, yeah, and there we're quite uh, active on there, letting people know what we're up to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that everyone's Instagrams and Facebooks and things are now on the screen somewhere uh, for people to follow. So please do um, follow um, Kyla, Joe, Nisha and Shonali. And thank you so much for joining this very special International Women's Day event to everyone at home. Um, I want to especially thank you HowlRound who are making this technically possible and Epside Cinema Club who is um, a, a feminist cinema club um, in Romania who are supporting us. Um, and to invite you to our next event in two weeks time, March 22nd with an incredible company called Jubilee Pen. Uh, they are the first Roma feminist uh, theater company uh, in Romania and they make some incredible work. We'll be streaming their show Cor Purban and then we'll be having a conversation with Mihaila Dragan uh, and Zita Moldovan who um, are actors uh, and also run the company and Daldeza who uh, is an activist for Roma women's rights with the association E Romania. So thank you so much again, everyone. I'm very grateful for this conversation. Um, and I look forward to keeping in touch with all of you and learning more from you and your incredible work. Bye. <laughs>